This episode is all about the hunt for the face-off killer and Grace, his daughter! Also some stuff with J.J. and Reed and Reed's mother Jane Lynch. The main plot stuff first. It turns out that the face-off killer had the worst plan in the world. Here it is. Be the most wanted man in America and walk into a secure government building while not wearing a disguise of any meaningful kind. Then figure out how to get a gun and shoot your way out while you're already in the building. Also, don't plan to get away vehicle, just hope that you can steal one while being chased. Amazingly, this terrible plan works. Faceoff wants to split up so he and his daughter will be harder to find. She has an alternate plan. Step 1. Kill these two people, who coincidentally live within a 10 minute walk of the place where the faceoff killer randomly decided to ditch his car. This wouldn't be a coincidence if these were two random people. But in fact, they're millionaires who sponsored a scholarship that Grace won while she was enrolled in prep school under a fake name. Step 2. Steal the keys to the couple's Georgetown condo, which I guess she also knew they had, somehow, and lure Grace's prep school girlfriend, who's also a millionaire, back to it so they can cut off her thumbprint so that Grace can pretend to be her and empty out her safety deposit box. This plan also involves getting a red wig the exact length of her girlfriend's hair, which doesn't seem like it would be easy to do in downtown Washington, D.C. when you're the two most wanted people in America. Amazingly, this plan works perfectly, and the BAU utterly fails to stop any part of it. They're awful at their jobs. Why do I say they're awful at their jobs? Simple. They should have been onto the girlfriend and the millionaires immediately. What's the first thing you do when you're looking for someone? Run down all of their contacts. Yes, that's what the characters do, eventually, but the point is... This work should have already been done. Supposedly David has been obsessively working on tracking down Faceoff for a full six months at this point, and his key resource in that hunt was supposedly Faceoff's daughter, Grace. So why don't they have a single bit of her biography at their fingertips? The moment she goes missing in DC, they should have a list of every contact of hers in the area. They could have been waiting for her at the millionaire's house or the girlfriend's office. But since they never bothered looking into Grace at all until she escapes from prison, her plan succeeds completely. What has David been doing for the past half a year? Okay, now for the Reed stuff. JJ lets him down easy, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief. Then, his mother is suddenly completely sane for the first time in his life, and gives him a pep talk to try to get him to grow up. This scene would be more effective if it wasn't for the part where she talks about how her husband left the family because he couldn't deal with the up and down roller coaster of her meds? No, Jane. Reed's father left because you conspired to murder a man and he couldn't live with you knowing what you were capable of. This was covered back in season three. Why didn't you take Reed with him? We've never been given a straight answer on that, but given everything we know about Jane's personality, the reason is obviously that she threatened to kill herself and Reed if he tried to get custody. At the end of the episode, they find the girlfriend tied up and Grace dead in the condo, with her face cut off. Then we get a scene with Joe trying to get Grace's grandmother to help catch face off, leveraging the death of her granddaughter. So, is Grace really dead? My first thought was no, largely because there's no reason for face off to kill his own daughter, but leave the girlfriend alive. Only Grace would prioritize keeping her girlfriend alive. But David seems pretty sure. There's an explanation that covers both points, however. David is simply lying to Sharon to try and get her to help catch Faceoff. Then again, that plot point doesn't make sense either, because there's no reason to leave a fake Grace in the condo, since it wouldn't fool anyone for a second. Grace was in jail for the attempted murder of an FBI agent. They have her fingerprints, DNA, and dental records, so a body swap would deceive people for maybe five to ten minutes at best. This all leaves me baffled. If Grace is dead, there's no reason for the girlfriend to be alive. But if Grace is alive, there's no reason to leave a fake-out body. The closest the team can come to offering a suggestion for why Faceoff would kill his own daughter is that she was a liability who could help catch him, and he's always planned to kill her. Except no, there's no reason to think she could help catch him, and we know for a fact that he was freeing her because he felt he owed her. He was perfectly happy for the two of them to go off in separate directions once they ditched the cops. The dumbest thing about the episode, though, is that Emily apologizes to David for doubting him in the previous episode. This is idiotic for two reasons. One, he was wrong. Faceoff was not the killer they were looking for. And B, his decision to disobey orders allowed Faceoff to spring his daughter from prison and has, so far resulted in the deaths of seven people. They even suggest that Joe ruined Faceoff's plan by figuring out his connection to the doctor, but no, he didn't. Faceoff's plan went 
perfectly. The only reason his safe house was compromised was because he rented it using the lawyer's ID, an ID that was always going to be burned the minute he shot up the Justice Department. Faceoff's problems were caused not by Joe being clever, but by him being terrible at crime. Yes, the second episode of the season was even worse than the first. I wonder where they'll go from here.